This episode is sponsored by Tegas. Tegas is the new digital hub for market intelligence. The Tegas platform empowers investors and corporate development teams to invest smarter by pairing best-in-class technology with the highest quality user-generated content and data. Tegas content is powered by many of the world's leading institutional investors, where their expert calls are recorded, transcribed, and uploaded to the shared platform, leading to the highest quality content and data sets. Tegas also recently acquired BAMSEC, which will allow users to seamlessly toggle between financial data, management commentary, and expert interviews as they get up to speed on a company. Any customer who signs up for Tegas before May 31st will receive a free BAMSEC license as part of their subscription. Find out why a majority of top firms are using Tegas on a daily basis. Head to tegas.com slash Patrick for your free trial. This episode is sponsored by Delupa. Delupa streamlines a major pain point for investors. By capturing all of a company's KPIs and adjusting financials into their database, Delupa makes it easy to quickly update your models for what matters. So many investors I speak to complain about juggling multiple company earnings or rushing to ramp on a new investment. Delupa uses AI to find every KPI disclosed, from charts to text, and even from footnotes of investor presentations. Delupa updates these KPIs and data points in your existing Excel models in one click, regardless of your source or format. Try Delupa for free at delupa.com slash Patrick. This is Business Breakdowns. Business Breakdowns is a series of conversations with investors and operators diving deep into a single business. For each business, we explore its history, its business model, its competitive advantages, and what makes it tick. We believe every business has lessons and secrets that investors and operators can learn from, and we are here to bring them to you. To find more episodes of Breakdowns, check out joincolossus.com. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions. Hosts and podcast guests may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. This is Matt Russell, and today we are breaking down Baytex Energy. With oil prices hovering over $100 a barrel, we thought it was a particularly good time to revisit the sector. Now, the natural question is, why Baytex Energy? The 80,000 barrel day producer certainly isn't a household name. And with a market cap just north of $3 billion, it's far away from being a mega cap. But Baytex has production in five different operating areas spanning across the U.S. and Canada. Some of those fields are mature, some are emerging. The company's been allocating cash flow between unconventional wells, conventional wells, and debt reduction in recent years. When you take Baytex and everything that's happening within that business, it offers a perfect lens to view the historically boom and bust industry of oil production. To help break down Baytex, I'm joined by oil and gas investor Josh Young of Bison Interests. We cover how producers fit into the broader energy ecosystem, the differences between unconventional shale wells versus conventional wells, and how management teams think about capital allocation. Please enjoy this conversation on Baytex Energy. All right, Josh, thank you for joining us on Business Breakdowns. Thank you for having me. So we don't cover too many oil and gas names on business breakdowns. And I thought we could start at a high level here with Baytex within the energy value chain. And maybe you could describe the production of a barrel of oil, how it makes its way out of the ground to end users, and how Baytex, again, as an oil producer, fits into that equation. Baytex is a upstream oil and gas company, which means that they have the rights to produce on land that's not owned by them. They have leases and other sorts of arrangements with mineral owners and landowners to be able to access the minerals. And they pay to have those developed by oil services companies that provide rigs and other services. Wells are drilled on their land and then on the land that they have purchased the right to access. And then that oil and natural gas is gathered sometimes by their own infrastructure and sometimes by third-party infrastructure. And it's brought to processing plants and refineries and turned into gasoline and diesel and other products that are used across the economy. It almost sounds like the oil producer is the general contractor of the energy production stage where there's not actual ownership of a lot of assets, but there's a lot of coordination in terms of getting those barrels out of the ground. Is that a fair analog? Kind of, except they are the money as well. So they provide the capital to develop the assets 
or acquire producing assets. And then they are essentially trying to earn a profit by putting money into the ground and then through services and time and again through acquiring the rights to the resource and then hope to earn a profit. So to get all that money back and then some, it's like general contractors that risk pretty much all of the money and then are hoping to earn a speculative profit on the activity. Maybe the spec home builder is the better comparison there. Maybe we can actually go through the economics of the value chain as well. If we use a reasonable round number today of $100 per barrel of oil, how much would Baytex as an oil producer keep? And what are some of the rules of thumb that go into it in terms of how much goes to a rig operator, how much goes to the midstream pipelines, how much goes to the refineries? What's the best way to think about the distribution of the value in that $100? What's interesting about oil and gas is there are so many different kinds of oil fields and so many different activities among different companies in the space that some of the answers for Baytex might not be as generalizable as I guess we'd like. Baytex has fields in the US and Canada, and their fields range from more unconventional shale, like the Eagleford shale that they own a non-operated interest in, to relatively conventional heavy oil that they're developing in Alberta and Saskatchewan. The answer in terms of the economics that they realize, as well as what the activities look like and who else benefits, varies across the majority private land ownership in Texas, where there are private mineral owners who benefit substantially from royalties on activity on Bay Texas wells. And actually, in that case, it's Marathon Oil that's drilling the wells and Bay Texas participating, essentially funding. It's like there's another general contractor out there that's managing the stuff and owns most of it and Bay Tex owns some of it. They write checks to participate in their interest. And then that other general contractor, in this case, Marathon, gets to produce the oil, sell it, and Bay Tex gets their share of it. So it ranges from that which is an activity where the highest single expense is fracking. It's the pressure pumping and related activities that are associated with unconventional shale development to heavy oil, where almost 100% of the expenditures are related to the drilling and then trucking or tying into pipe of heavy oil. We can go through each of those, or we can go holistically what it looks like as a company. One of the reasons that Baytex is so interesting is because they span this range of activity, they span different hydrocarbons and they illustrate some of the different property ownership setups of the oil and gas industry. I think we should definitely revisit the economics. And I think the best way to do that is probably to look on a basin by basin or geographical location basis. Maybe it's a good opportunity to transition to Baytex itself and get an opportunity to go over the history of the business and how they got to where they are today. So maybe you can give us a broad overview of the business and how it was formed and how it was developed into what it is today as a producer. Baytex has actually spanned a few different business models. I started my career doing management consulting and the firm I was at, they had this idea of profit models where ultimately many different sorts of businesses could be boiled down to relatively few mechanisms for turning business activity into profit, which is really what business is about, is generating profit and then distributing that profit. The first activity that Baytex was really involved with was when they were founded and taken public in 1993, they were essentially a roll-up of assets that were producing in Canada. So what a roll-up is, you take a public company and you issue stocks. So in their case, they issued the initial shares at 40 cents and then a dollar a share. You try to find assets that you can buy that are worth more in your control than they are in the seller's control. There's another way to describe it, which is acquire and exploit. So that's a more oil and gas specific term, but generally they were a roll up of assets and they acted in that capacity as kind of a US C Corp normal type structure from 1993 through 2003. After they operated as that for a number of years through a number of different transactions, they turned into what's called a royalty trust or an energy trust, 
And at the time in Canada, there were significant laws that favored, from a tax perspective, energy trusts. Baytex, actually, they spun out some of their unconventional assets, which are now a different company, Crew Energy, and they issued additional shares and created a energy trust. So they re-IPO'd. And that structure, incidentally, was even more favorably aligned with their and acquire and exploit strategy with an extra aspect, which was that they would pay out nearly 100%, or in some cases, more than 100% of the cash flow that they were generating from the business. So it was less about buying and doing better and more about buying, doing better and paying out absolutely the maximum that they could. And royalty trusts at the time were valued based on how much they paid out, not necessarily how sustainable that was. So there was this whole game to try to pay out as much as possible and to acquire as much as they could. And they engaged in that for a number of years as well. And then that trust structure broke down. There was a change in the tax law. I believe it was around 2006 where these royalty trusts were forced to restructure because the tax exemption that they were relying on was closed because it was apparently too favorable for the companies and too many companies in Canada were becoming trusts. And so they switched over to a less dividend oriented or distribution oriented company and went back to the acquire and exploit model, did a number of other transactions through essentially the downturn in 2014. They did a large debt finance transaction in 2014 And again, I'm kind of skipping forward a little, but if you think about the history of the business, what it's been is finding interesting assets, acquiring them using stock, debt, and cash from operations, and then having this sort of view that a bigger company with more assets would end up being worth more than it would have been if they hadn't assumed the debt necessary to acquire the additional assets that they brought on. And what does that asset base look like today in terms of where they're located and how much they're producing? So today they're producing just under 85,000 barrels of oil equivalent a day. It's about 75% oil. They're producing about 30,000 barrels a day in South Texas and the Eagleford Shale. And then it breaks down pretty cleanly between production in heavy oil in the border of Alberta and Saskatchewan, as well as heavy oil production in this new area that makes them particularly interesting to talk about in the Clearwater in Alberta, which is this new oil discovery that they were involved with. And then some production in more conventional oil and gas production in central Alberta. Maybe a good way to work through this is to go one by one with shale well and the economics in the Eagleford then move on to maybe one of the more established heavy oil plays that they have exposure to, and then down the line to the Clearwater. Starting with shale, maybe you can walk us through what the production of a barrel of oil from a shale basin looks like, and some description on what got investors so excited about the U.S. shale boom in the late 2000s and early 2010s before the eventual downturn that we've seen and maybe level set expectations in terms of what shale means relative to heavy oil, what the break-even costs for a shale barrel of oil are, and some of the other considerations that go into that. These are great questions and thoughts. And this is really, I think, important relative to the overall oil and gas industry, as well as the topic of inflation, which has become so central to economic discussions and investments, because the shale boom in the US and then in Canada helped keep energy costs in the U.S. down from a surplus of natural gas production, as well as helping keep global oil costs down over the last number of years through essentially unexpected high production from individual wells and many of those wells getting drilled to the point where the world actually had a glut of oil for several years purely from drilling wells in South Texas, West Texas, and a few other places. In the Eagleford, it's kind of remarkable because Baytex and the predecessor company that they acquired in 2014 has been actively drilling wells in the Eagleford since I think 2010. Despite that, they show over 200 remaining drillable locations on their land. 
which again is pretty remarkable given how many wells, I think there are several hundred already that have been drilled there. The story for shale as seen through this Eagleford asset for Baytex as well as others is that there's been this almost continual downspacing. So the ability to get more wells in on a given amount of land, along with increasing the recoveries from those wells such that you end up with increasing amounts of oil relative to initial expectations. And then the general trend until recently has been falling costs on an absolute basis, which means as oil well productivity was rising from 2010 to, I think it peaked around 2018, as well productivity was rising and well costs were falling, this was driving down the marginal cost of production for oil and natural gas. For natural gas, that was a North American phenomenon because natural gas is mostly landlocked here in North America. There's relatively little export capacity and there's a global market for oil. And so this activity, amazingly, through individual wells that were producing roughly a thousand barrels a day on initial production and that declined quite fast, somehow the industry was able to stack enough of those up, drill enough of those wells over time to be able to actually glut the global oil market, which produces roughly 100 million barrels a day worldwide. It sounds like in the shale plays, just to summarize that, there was the ability to identify where oil was within the ground and actually produce more or take more out of that rock than was previously expected. So was that a major breakthrough in technology? Was it better identification of where exactly the oil was? What was the main driver to increase the productivity on a well-by-well basis versus where it was before? There were a few factors that coincided. So one was the ability to do a lot of reps, essentially to be able to drill many wells and experiment with them and be able to get to the point where on the thousandth well, you might be way more efficient at drilling. You might've figured out a lot better where to place sand. So there were lots of opportunities for optimization because there was so much activity and so much money getting spent. There were lots of opportunities for scientists and inventors to come up with new equipment and invent new processes that they were strongly economically incentivized to do because they could save oil and gas companies and service providers lots of money while also making a lot of money themselves. And then the mineral rights arrangement in the US in particular is somewhat unique with private mineral ownership, which is different. Again, like in Canada, almost all the minerals are held by the crown, by the government of Canada. And in other countries as well, generally minerals are owned by the governments. They're not owned by private landowners and essentially private citizens. And so that opened up the alignment of interest between the people that controlled essentially access to the resource, the mineral rights owners, the surface owners, and so on, with the people that wanted to and the companies that wanted to extract the oil. There was the ability to have a lot of reps. There was the ability to invent a lot. And then there was the ability to access the land. And then finally, to get to the point where there was an oil glut, there was a boom of essentially low cost financing. So very low interest rates, the search for yield, a private equity boom simultaneously. And so there was this wash of capital looking to go somewhere. Shale was identified as a place where as you deployed more money, your wells got more efficient and got to a lower required oil price break even. And so there were hundreds of billions of dollars that were invested in there. And ironically, much of that money ended up getting lost because there was too much that came in and too much of a good thing. And what does that break even look like today in the Eagleford? It's actually a more complicated question than you'd think because after years of underinvestment, all that activity hit a crescendo in 2018 and started to slow down. And then during COVID, a lot of activity fell off. The industry is in the process of rebuilding activity levels. As that's happening, service costs, so the cost to rent a rig and access the labor necessary and the equipment necessary to drill a well, the cost to acquire or rent pressure pumping equipment, and again, labor and related equipment, these costs are actually rising rapidly in real time. What 
companies thought things would cost, let's say six months ago, are quite different from where they'll cost today. So for example, in the Eagleford, if you look at what a well cost a year ago for Baytex, their land and the activities are pretty much in the core of that Eagleford shale play. Their wells were costing under, in some cases, $5 million. And they were coming on in the first year with average production for the year of about 700 barrels of oil equivalent a day. They were expected to realize about 800,000 barrels of oil equivalent over the life of the well. For that math to work, the wells came on at, on average, around 1,000 barrels a day. And then by the end of the year, were declined out to maybe 300 barrels a day. You end up with stable production after a few years of, let's say, 50 barrels a day, where it stops declining quite so much. And over 30 years, maybe the wells get to 800,000 barrels or so. That was the cost last year. Right now, it might cost as much as $7 million to drill, complete, equip, and tie in that same well. And that number is not static. It's moving, and it may be likely to move significantly higher. Those numbers are all great. And I should probably be able to do the math backhand. But in terms of where they think about the oil price break even being, whether that's $40 a barrel, $50 a barrel, $60 a barrel, with an understanding that it's going to move around a lot and there's going to be inflation. But is there a general rule of thumb or barometer for what they think of as the break even price in that region? I try to stay away from that because there were a lot of claims by oil company executives during the shale boom, as well as by private equity funds and private companies that sold assets for huge valuations. They would make various claims, hey, our break even is $25 a barrel or $30 a barrel. And many of those claims were unrealistic to potentially worse descriptions than that. And so I think the better way to look at it or the way that I'm more comfortable with looking at it is what is the return at some substantial discount to the current price for oil? So Baytex, if you just look at their corporate presentation, they claim at $65 oil with lower well costs than they're probably seeing right now, but higher than they saw a year ago, they're claiming 500% plus rates of return on their Eagle Ford at $65 oil. Is it that? Probably not. But there's various costs that go in that get excluded. There's various expenses that are way higher now that oil is higher and activity levels are rising. But are they earning a greater than 100% rate of return on that excluding the cost to have acquired the asset in the first place? Yeah, they're probably making a lot of money on these wells. In my assessment of these sorts of companies and in these assets for Baytex, my approach is more to be directionally correct than precisely wrong. So if you really wanted to estimate maybe the break even here, assuming a static service cost, and that cost probably is lower at those lower prices, it's probably in the $30 to $35 a barrel range. But again, understanding that those sorts of metrics often exclude a lot of costs and maybe aren't the best way to think about it. I think you mentioned something earlier in that answer, which I want to unpack a little bit, and I think it'll play into how we talk about some of the other regions as well. You mentioned that the well might come on at a thousand barrels a day, and then by the end of year one, that's going to look something like 300 barrels a day. So that's a pretty steep decline in terms of the production profile of the well. I assume what that also means is you get a faster payback on that well because you're seeing the majority of the production come up front in the life of the well. How would you describe that production of a shale well and that decline rate relative to some of the other conventional or unconventional plays? And in my mind, that just screams, okay, if I need to keep my production profile up high, I'm going to continuously need to drill. So is that the right thought process to be thinking about shale players where you are seeing spending up front, but you're going to have to repeat that spending on a continual basis in order to keep any production profile? Absolutely. The right way to think about unconventional producers, shale producers, is to think about companies that need to reinvest a substantial portion of their cash flow in order to sustain their production. And obviously that changes at different oil prices. So the percentage that Baytex needs to reinvest at $50 oil is different than at 100 because the decline rate of the well doesn't really care if oil is at 10 or 100. It just produces out. There's things companies can do to change that. But generally, the production decline rate is going to be what it is. 
there is some leverage to higher oil prices, but there's also some negative leverage to higher service costs in that business model. And the right way to think about an unconventional business is the free cash flow generated over mid cycle oil prices rather than thinking about the EBITDA or the operating cash flow without, again, factoring in the maintenance capital to sustain production. Now, if we take a barrel of shale oil, I think we would consider that light sweet and compare that to a barrel of oil produced in Canada. And I'm going to be talking a little bit on the heavy side of things. What are some of the differences in terms of the quality of the oil comes out and some of the use cases? We all think about oil as a commodity and the definition of commodity is something very substitutable, but there are differences. So maybe you could just give us a quick overview of the differences of what we see coming out of Texas versus what we see coming out of Canada. The very high level is that different oil blends with different gravities. So very dense oil has lower gravity and less dense, almost gaseous oil has much higher gravity. They go into refining processes and end up yielding different amounts of diesel or jet fuel versus gasoline versus other oil products. Heavier oil, given certain standard refining processes, might yield more diesel, whereas light oil might yield more gasoline and other products. But again, that's not something that I track the refining spreads for these different products to make sure that they're economic. And I track those trends to make sure that they're not about to be a lot less economic, but the specifics around the chemistry, it's something that only matters to a company like Baytex insofar as they're not on the wrong side of a long-term trend. It is an interesting, perhaps nerdier point on the chemistry and exactly what it's burning off and what's going through that refinery. The point being that there is a bit of a different demand point and demand case for some of those barrels relative to the ones down in Texas. Maybe we can transition over to the Canadian assets of Baytex being listed in Canada, and you can give us an overview of where they operate there and the production profile and how that might differ versus U.S. Shell, please. There is one last thing on the oil quality question, which I think is worth talking about for a second. So one benefit that Baytex has of having so much of their production in Canada and not being a full U.S. unconventional shale producer is that because U.S. shale grew so much, so unexpectedly, the refining slate in the U.S., mostly along the Gulf Coast, isn't really oriented to process the oil that's coming out of unconventional shale, primarily in South Texas and West Texas. And so what happens is that a lot of the oil that's getting produced out of these shale plays actually ends up getting exported to foreign refineries that are better suited to refine those products. And then heavier oil gets imported to come to the refineries along the Gulf Coast and elsewhere that are oriented towards that heavy product. And so one thing that's really interesting about Canadian heavy oil is that it actually meets a lot of the criteria for US Gulf Coast refiners. There's this interesting phenomenon where when you look at Baytex and you look at their production in South Texas and where it ends up, especially on the oil side, the natural gas gets used likely within Texas, but the oil likely gets exported and then refined in Asian refineries or elsewhere, or gets brought down surreptitiously to Venezuela and then blended with their heavy oil to transport it elsewhere. The oil that they're producing in Canada, in some cases, is actually brought down to the Gulf Coast and refined not that far from where their eagle for production is. So their production, actually, a lot of it travels quite far even though some of their production is quite close to where there are active refineries. Where beyond Canada does the U.S. import that heavier oil from? We get it from Venezuela still, even though we pretend like we don't. We used to get it from Russia. And there's various other producing regions that produce heavy oil that we import it from. But the reality is a lot of it's coming still from Venezuela and other places that we just try to pretend. There's this joke now with Russian exports being limited and in some cases either sanctioned or self-sanctioned. There's a joke about, I think it's a Latvian blend, which is funny because there's no oil in Latvia. So 
they're essentially importing oil from Russia, blending it with oil from elsewhere, and then pretending that it's not Russian oil. I think there's a lot of that that happens for oil imports to the US. It's one reason from an energy independence and national security perspective, which is something that people used to think a lot about for oil and gas and have thought about it less until very recently. It's a reason why it's important that this oil is produced in the US and Canada. And it's a way in which Canadian oil production is actually very strategic to US energy security because it's so useful for US refining slates. Great point. It's something that I was speaking to someone on a call about last week, which is it's not part of the narrative with everything going on in Europe right now, which is somewhat amazing considering 15 years ago, it felt like everything revolved around our energy dependence on outside countries. Really interesting how much can change when a large amount of capital goes into a sector and necessity breeds innovation. So that's a good opportunity again to transition over to the Canadian side of things. Again, maybe a snapshot of what Baytex's Canadian operations look like would be a good place to start. So Baytex has a few assets in Canada that are worth focusing on. One is their Viking asset. Ironically, the biggest transaction Baytex ever did in terms of dilution versus acquiring assets was their merger with Raging River, where they issued about 50% of outstanding shares. So they issued about as many shares as they had before to merge with Raging River, which just had one asset, Viking oil production. There was some other stuff that came with it, but essentially from a production perspective, it was almost all Viking oil, which is light oil that's similar to US shale, except each well is a fraction of the cost and produces a fraction of the oil. That was an interesting transaction because on one hand, it really changed the nature of the company by dramatically increasing the shares outstanding, as well as increasing the decline rate, because again, unconventional oil declines so much faster than conventional. On the other hand, because of the timing of that transaction, Batex was able to survive multiple oil crashes since the transaction. And so on one hand, it was highly dilutive and brought in an asset that actually declined off a lot since the transaction. On the other hand, it may be the reason why Baytex exists in its current form and didn't have to go bankrupt when heavy oil prices in Canada went to almost zero in 2018. And then again, when oil prices actually went negative very briefly in 2020. To recap, the benefit there was a diversification of the oil production quality. And also that Raging River had relatively little debt Baytex was able to issue equity through the acquisition or merger with Raging River, get enough production and enough cash flow that they were able to survive through the downturn in 2018. And then that positioned them to be able to do some things that looked a little funny to outsiders, but actually allowed them to survive the 2020 downturn as well. So it makes sense to start with the Viking because it took so many shares and became such a big part of the business, even though on a production basis, I think they're only producing like 10,000 barrels a day or so from the Viking currently. It's kind of this interesting thing. They use 50% of their shares to end up with, I think when they bought it, it was producing a little over 17,000 barrels a day now of production of the Viking. So it's declined off some and you you have this 80 something thousand barrel a day producer. They used 50% of their shares of their current shares are attributable to only 17,000 barrels a day. So it makes it noteworthy. It's actually not a huge asset for them anymore. It generates some free cash flow. The returns are decent, but not remarkable. They're actually kind of on the lower side versus some of the other things that Baytex does, but it's worth mentioning first just because of the history of the business and how many shares went out versus what the business looks like today. From a return perspective, before going to the other assets, again, just using their numbers and then sanity checking them, they claim that at $65 oil, these wells pay out in a little more than a year with an 82% IRR. Realistically, probably they pay out in a year and a half at $65 oil, but that's still not bad. 
you don't get much profit beyond that at that sort of price. So you really need higher prices. And they have a huge amount of inventory there because again, it's a little bit less economic than some of their other stuff. So they're able to slow play it, allow production to decline a little, generate a lot of free cash flow from the asset, and then redeploy it into some of their higher return core assets. In addition to their Viking oil play, they have heavy oil-oriented lands across a few different places, and they have a more US-style shale play that they're incubating that also makes them a very interesting business. And this is an aspect of the business that I think people don't fully understand and offers one of the more interesting aspects of oil and gas, or really of any sector after a long downturn, where many people don't even know where to look to find giant assets that are just not being attributed any value by the market for various reasons. The capital allocation points there are particularly interesting when talking about the economics of those wells at 65, but I think you referenced what the Eagleford wells were And I think we'll get to the Clearwater as well and the excitement around that asset. Beyond Viking, what are the major assets that you would point to in Canada or what else is worth speaking about for Baytex? Their historic heavy oil at Lloydminster and Peace River is great. These are the assets they built their company on over many years. And it's a funny thing that they've almost become a side note. So they're the largest, other than the Eagleford, they're the largest producing asset set, but they're just not the focus of the business anymore. They've also essentially become cash cows, even though their returns are phenomenal as well. So for their Peace River multilaterals outside of the Clearwater At 65, they cite a 120% rate of return. Again, (laughs) you sanity check that, you sandbag it, 50%, still pretty good. Same idea, Lloydminster, actually those returns are very high. I think one of the things that's happening there is that they were quite low. They were actually the lowest of all of their assets. And then they've been applying some of the new technology that's being used in the Clearwater to this legacy asset. And they show 300% type rates of return. Honestly, I would just toss that. I don't think that's a real return that's applicable to that whole asset base. But if you got a 75 or 100% rate of return at $65 oil, that's still quite noteworthy and doesn't require a lot of hand-waving and probably reflects the full cost, including acquiring the land, building infrastructure, and all these other factors that I think are often overlooked and probably also factors in higher services costs. So you have these base businesses at Baytex, you have their Eagleford back in the US, where it's generating a lot of free cash flow, they don't even operate it. They have this long runway there to just sit on it, generate free cash flow, participate. They have their Viking, which is also for sitting on that too, allowing it to decline a little, generate a lot of free cash flow, even at much lower prices. You have their heavy oil, similar idea. It's not really something they're focusing on or ramping up. And then you have their clear water, which is very sexy and a reason a lot of people, I think, own their stock today. And then you have their Duvernay, which is this shale play that I think is one of the keys to a potential re-rate for their company. And that I think is one of the value adds that we can do here, which is to talk about how to find hidden assets and how to evaluate them, especially if a company won't even really talk about it much or emphasize it. Before we jump, I think we should hit on the Clearwater next. For the heavy oil assets, Lloyd Minister, what does that decline rate look like for those assets? Again, comparing it back to the U.S. shale wells. It varies a little bit, but I think the right way to think about these sorts of assets is they're actually most similar to Gulf of Mexico offshore wells, where the traditional offshore well would produce pretty strongly for a few years with roughly a 25 or 30% decline rate. Maybe the initial year of production might have a higher decline rate. It would produce for a few years and then water out. With shale, the idea is that you could potentially have a well that declines a lot rapidly and then flattens out and produces for a long time. With conventional wells, in some cases, you basically get flat production for a long time. And in other cases, you get pretty good production for a few years and then nothing. And it's not 
that all of the wells go to zero after a few years, but many of them do. And I think the right way to think about, especially on the Lloydminster side of Baytex's business, is just wells that have great initial returns, decline much less fast than shale wells, but they never slow or they don't really get to that stable, low production rate for a long time. Many of the wells just, they die. Good opportunity to now transition over to Clearwater. It's something that in just doing some basic research on the business was popping up quite frequently in terms of the most exciting asset, the most interesting asset, perhaps just being a little less known. Maybe you can go through what that looks like for Baytex, what it represents today in terms of any production, any size, and how you think about framing that opportunity for the business. What's interesting for the Clearwater is this is important in terms of illustrating the different business models in upstream oil and gas. And again, one of the reasons that Baytex is so interesting because it spans so many of these different business models. After the highly dilutive deal that they did to survive, I can't criticize it because they likely wouldn't exist without having gone through bankruptcy currently if they hadn't done that deal. But after doing their deal to get the Viking asset through a merger with Raging River, they lost their appetite for the acquire and exploit strategy that they had started and grown the business through. One of the things that Baytex did that's actually quite rare in oil and gas today, and was even rarer when they were doing this over the last couple of years, is they identified a trend that was working, they acquired land for almost no upfront cost, and they explored on that land to see if their geologic theory would translate to economic oil reservoirs that they could then go further explore, delineate, and then develop. Baytex's main clear water asset is on the Pevine Metis settlement, which is the equivalent of a American Indian reservation. On that settlement, they came in and they paid, I think it was a few million dollars in a lease bonus to acquire the rights to produce oil and gas on that settlement, on that land. The minerals are still owned by the crown. So they're still owned by the government of Canada, but they also are paying the settlement I think it's a 6% override, something along those lines, royalty, which might sound like a lot, but in the US, the typical royalty is 25%. And in Canada on crown lands, it's a sliding scale from I think 3% on the low end, and you can get up to 30% or so at really high oil prices after wells have paid out, paying 6% in addition to the initial rate of 3% or whatever for the crown royalty is actually not a very high royalty. But what it did is it aligned Baytex with the local people. And this is especially relevant because it's a settlement and not raw land governed by Alberta, but it's a very intelligent way to go about things. And then it was a deviation from the trend for the business, which has mostly been, especially among public oil and gas companies, to either develop out existing assets or to acquire assets that have been explored for and already delineated and somewhat developed. Baytex is a, they call it E and P company, so exploration and production, and they actually do some of the exploration Other companies do this, right? They're not alone, but this is probably one of the best success cases of exploration activity by companies like Baytex in many years. Maybe we could talk just really quickly about what that exploration phase actually looks like. Picture somebody on the beach with a metal detector scanning around and getting some bounce that tells them there's oil down there. What does that process actually look like in terms of identifying where oil might be, because I think this is often miles below the ground level. So what does that process look like for any of these businesses? It really varies depending on who's looking and where they're looking and what activity there's been in the area. A starting point in an area where there's been no oil drilling activity or no drilling activity at all, there are various signposts that people would look for a hundred years ago if they're looking for an oil field. Is there oil seepage that makes it to the ground where one of the reservoirs has essentially a leak and somehow it makes its way to the surface? 
are there certain geologic features that make it likely that there's a trap which would indicate that maybe there's a structure geologically underground that could hold essentially a conventional oil pool. In this case, because there's been a lot of activity in the general area historically, I believe there were several vertical wells that had been drilled either through the land historically or in the general area that would have given an indication that there would be oil present in this formation. It was probably a combination of seismic, where they had seismic maps over the general area to identify that there's a zone that could hold this oil, as well as old well logs, essentially looking at what it looked like to drill down through that historically, and then combining those two and comparing them to other wells in the general region that were productive or weren't productive and to calibrate what the likelihood of success was there. And again, I'm saying this with some speculation because they actually haven't fully shared how they approached this, partly because they've been acquiring additional land in other areas, likely with the same strategy. A lot of this is generalizable, which is why I can talk about it. I'm not giving away any of their secrets, but it's possible that there are certain geologic keys that they had to figure out this particular thing that they're better off not telling people about and then going and buying more land elsewhere to potentially replicate their success here. It's an interesting piece of the business. I remember reading about Aubrey McClendon and I think Tom Ward as well in their early days of acquiring assets and figuring out where to drill, literally just going into the libraries and going through some of the drilling history in the region. And this was way back when I think a lot of the industry took off in that Oklahoma City area. There's all different ways to do it. And then you have the opposite side of the spectrum where I remember when I first started my career at Goldman, we brought a deal for a business that had a bunch of acreage off the coast of West Africa. And the idea was that when you look back at Pangea, it was lined up with Brazil and that same plate along the coast of Brazil produced a ton of oil. So in their mind, it would make sense if they produced a lot of oil in West Africa. So there's all different methodologies that you can use. I don't think those wells off the coast of West Africa turned out to be too profitable, but nonetheless. So for you as an analyst looking at the Clearwater project, looking at how you're going to decide on what's an attractive opportunity. How do you approach this in terms of how much capital is going into that project, what you're initially looking for, maybe just the process for you as an investor to evaluate initial well returns, what these look like, and how you go about thinking about it as an investment? It's tough partly because there hasn't really been this sort of activity at scale in a while. And generally, I actually don't like to invest in exploratory stage companies because there's too much of a chance of failure. Historically, especially among public companies, the expected value of the exploration activity through a public company structure is obviously less than the dollars it would cost to participate. I don't like participating in activities that aren't high expected value, forget lower than return of capital likelihood. In this case, it was interesting because there were some initial indications of success in the Clearwater without that being valued in their stock at the point where I ended up sizing up my investment in the company. And so ahead of time, I probably would have attributed zero value to this. I might have even attributed negative value to the spending that was necessary to explore this, but it wasn't really expensive for the company to do most of the exploration activity here. The land cost was very low. I think they spent a few million dollars on the land, a few million dollars on science around it, and a few million dollars on drilling the first wells. It was not a free look, but a very cheap look. And it was a very easy thing to be comfortable with. I already owned some of the stock before these initial results came out. So again, from my perspective, It was pretty hard, especially given how little information they wanted to provide, because to the extent this was successful, and it was, they wanted to be able to go replicate the process they used elsewhere if they could find anything else that would be similar. Really not enough information as an outside public investor, potential investor in the company to really vet it and figure out if there was some significant upside. But once the results came out for their first couple of wells, where actually they were available through 
the Alberta Energy Regulators website before the company announced them, which was amazing, but also, hey, you know, any way you can get public information about companies and then effectively utilize it, more power to you. So they had a couple of wells that were very small. In the clear water, it's a little different than other shale plays or other unconventional plays because they drill multiple laterals. So they're essentially drilling multiple horizontal wells all from the same well bore. These initial wells, they had two laterals and then newer wells they've drilled with eight laterals from one well bore. It was interesting because those came on at 175 barrels a day each approximately based on the data that was out. And that was a number that actually, when I tried to explain this to some people, they thought that was a very low number and they couldn't understand why I was so excited about it. And of course, that reaction to me made it more exciting to go buy even more because people just didn't get it. There was some linear extrapolation with some amount of discount that was appropriate where if they produced 175 from two, they would reasonably produce, let's say, three times that if they got eight. So it wouldn't be four times that, but it would be some degree of extrapolation up. And it turned out that that was a reasonable assessment. Obviously, the costs for the wells are higher when you drill eight laterals instead of two. But on a development basis, if you drill a single well or two wells, it costs a lot to move a rig, to arrange for all the various other services and so on. Your one or two well cost could actually be quite high. So their cost to go from two lateral wells to eight lateral wells didn't actually go up that much when they started to drill them in a sort of steady, continuous program versus just drilling one or two wells at a time. And is this all tapping into the same reservoir? So I'm picturing this as you have your initial vertical well, which goes down, you have your offshoots of eventually it makes that 90 degree angle and starts going horizontally. Is it all tapping into essentially one layer of the rock underneath? It depends. In this case, it's not. It's actually not even in the Clearwater Formation. It's in the Spirit River Formation, which is similar to the Clearwater, but not the same. That's, I think, one of the ways that this particular field was missed is that it was actually not the same depth, not the same zone. Other companies that were looking just for the same Clearwater zone might have missed this, whereas Baytex was looking throughout the Spirit River formation, which is multiple different zones, including the clear water. There's an excellent graphic of a jelly donut and then a layer cake. I don't know if you've seen this one before, and it just uses it as an analogy to the advancements in drilling where the old vertical drilling was just plugging right down into the jelly donut, trying to capture as much as possible. And the new horizontal drilling, you really get down into those layers of the cake and the different zones. So it's always interesting to talk about. And I think it's something that a generalist often misses is there could be Eagle Ferd in the same area as the Permian because they're just different zones and different layers of the earth. And these could be located different states. So it's just like an interesting dynamic that I always appreciate. I think it's interesting because for example, for Bay Texas Clearwater, I don't think the actual Clearwater zone is productive for oil where they are but their spirit river is. You have this interesting dynamic where you can have, like you're saying, the same zone in a different place and it's just not productive. And then in some cases, you actually have that sort of layer cake phenomenon where you actually can have multiple zones be productive. And then that also can get confusing, right? Because one zone might be highly productive in one spot and then even a few miles away might be much less productive. It's a sort of complexity that you've picked up on that makes valuation quite complicated and requires a lot of technical expertise. One of the things that I skipped over that is extremely important in understanding this and was one of the things that got me a lot more comfortable with it was when I saw this, <laughs> I'm not a geologist and I'm not an engineer. I think there's a lot of humility that goes into these things and there's a lot of benefit in recognizing what you don't know. There's also a lot of history that you don't have by not being a geologist or an engineer or so on. And so many people that looked at this particular area didn't like it for various reasons based on their prior knowledge, either their activity in the area or their personal conception of 
what the geology would be like or what the oil would be like. There was concern that the oil would be too heavy. There was concern that would be too much H2S, essentially poisonous gas that could make the operations more expensive as well as lower the quality and the sale price of the oil. There were various other concerns that people had. One of the things that I did, and I think it's relevant for evaluating similar things in other places, is I found people who were experts in this sort of thing without a lot of prior negative or positive history with this particular field. And so finding multiple different people with different perspectives on this particular asset and on this particular discovery was helpful. And knowing those people right away and being able to get feedback on this within a couple hours was a huge advantage because once this information ended up on the Alberta Energy Regulator's website, the stock started to go vertical. Being able to accurately, rapidly assess the thing without bias and being able to find the right set of experts to evaluate something makes a big difference. And I think it's sort of a generalizable lesson for oil and gas evaluation where there's risks on both sides of it. If you don't know anything and you think you can evaluate it, it's probably a mistake. If you're an expert in it, you probably don't want to be the person evaluating it either because there's a big risk that your prior personal experience may bias your evaluation as well. You described that opportunity almost like it was an option value that's embedded in the equity price and a very cheap option if you're paying anything for it all. How would you describe the Duvernay in that same category? How do you go about ascribing value to something that sounds like they've disclosed very little about and give little attention to today and the market gives little attention to today? Duvernay is actually different than the Clearwater because Clearwater went from essentially zero to 60. It went from there being no one attributing value, no one even really knowing the company had it to suddenly them having highly productive, extraordinarily highly economic wells in the hottest play in Canada, possibly one of the hottest plays in North America for oil and gas. So suddenly they went from a nobody to three out of the top five wells, ironically competing with Neil Rozelle's new company. So the guy who was the CEO of Raging River, who sold them their last company, now has another very similar company in the Clearwater. And this time, Baytex is already there and they have the top two wells and three out of the top five and many out of the top 20. That's kind of different because they've ramped it up already to a development stage. They have thousands of barrels a day of production and they're on track to maybe getting to 10,000 barrels a day of production over the next year or so from an asset that had zero with relatively little capital to be able to get it to there because the wells pay back in one or two months. You stick 10 or $20 million into a program like that. You don't really need to inject more. You just are recycling that capital repeatedly. So the Duvernay is different because the wells are very big. And because up until recently with $100 oil, it takes a while for the wells to pay back. And so unlike some of the other fields we talked about, given the relatively early stage and that these wells are getting drilled one or two at a time, these wells have that high decline rate that you see with shale. And they also had until again, recently with higher oil prices, they also had a several year payback. You're going from your initial thousand plus barrel a day 30-day production rate way down pretty fast. So 70% plus first-year decline rates, but you're not getting all your money back in the first year, or you weren't anyway at lower prices. And you may not be getting your money back in the first two years at $50 or $60 oil. The company has intentionally slow played this because the idea is to focus on assets that generate a lot of free cash flow in order to fix the biggest problem the company had, which was existential risk from high debt levels. And that activity has paid off as they've paid off a lot of their debt. They have this thing that they've maintained enough. They have a couple thousand barrels a day of production. They invest 10 to $20 million a year to sustain the asset. They have this giant asset that in a sustainable high oil price environment, along with a situation where they can actually deploy meaningful capital into something and not just paying down debt, they've essentially preserved this right tail oil option. And because they've done this small amount of activity and maintained a small amount of production, 
the market isn't really attributing a lot to it. So given how volatile the world is and how volatile oil prices have been, there's this pay me now sort of approach and anything that's not really relevant within a couple of years or that doesn't really have good line of sight is being awarded very little value. But looking at the world and how much oil inventory is remaining and what other projects look like, this thing starts looking increasingly attractive from a holistic perspective, as well as from a sustained higher oil price, highly economic perspective. With the slower payback period, I, as a parallel, think about that as higher cost of production. So higher break-even cost at these higher oil prices, that changes the equation a bit. So you're essentially able to pay back those wells much faster. Something that comes into play here is just the visibility of that oil price. How do management teams and how does Baytex in particular think of a scenario where let's just isolate the Duvernay in this case and suggest that they could hedge out a hundred dollar barrel oil for the next 12 months and make sure that that production is hedged at a hundred dollars to ensure that they're locking in the profitability on those wells. That's the overly simplistic approach to this. How do they go about their hedging strategy and how does that differ or is it similar to the rest of the industry? Well, first of all, they can't hedge at that price. The forward curve for oil is a lot lower than the spot price for oil. So the amount you can lock in if you want to guarantee your oil price for the next year is maybe $85 a barrel or $90 a barrel versus the current hundred. So you can't really lock in the full current price for oil. And that's reflective of actually a tight inventory environment where storage providers or companies that have access to oil are being economically incentivized to provide their oil now instead of later. That's the reason that the forward curve for oil prices is structured like it is. Because they can't do that with this sort of asset and because this isn't their only asset, they're able to essentially hedge on a corporate basis. And they've typically been hedging 40 or 50% of their overall production. And then they just include this Duvernay asset as a part of their capital expenditure mix. And they take advantage of being a reasonably large company and being able to incorporate this longer life, longer oriented asset in the mix of these other assets that are spectacularly high return and really call most of their capital. Preserve the option value of those other assets while investing into the highest return assets. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the capital allocation strategy in general and give us an overview of the management team. It's not something that we talked about a lot, this management team, whether it's the same management team since that acquisition in 2014 with Raging River, I think the industry as a whole has a reputation of taking every dollar of operating cash flow and putting it back into the ground, regardless of where the oil price is. That has changed somewhat over the past couple of years, but maybe you can level set the expectations there on how Baytex compares to the industry and how this management team approaches capital allocation. The current CEO, Ed LaFerre, joined the company in 2016. That was before the merger that they did with Raging River. He had been senior executive at several other oil and gas companies where he had effectively navigated them through multiple cycles. I think it's important to identify that he wasn't involved so much in the levering up of the business. And he's kind of been a steady hand for the business in terms of delevering and doing things that people maybe didn't want so much from a levered producer. Generally, if you lever up, you're more risk loving and your investors might be more risk loving. And so he's come in with this mandate of delevering and turning Baytex into a less interesting company as a bet on oil prices and a more interesting company as a bet on the assets and cash flows from a medium to longer term perspective. He's been a very contentious figure among the prior shareholders who maybe were betting more on higher oil price. And fortunately for the business, he came in at the time that he did because he took necessary steps that were painful, but that allowed the business to survive and preserve the value, ironically, for many shareholders who were quite upset about things like that Raging River merger that was so dilutive. He could be a CEO of a 300,000 barrel a day company, and they're producing less than 100,000 barrels a day. He's 
allocated a lot of capital since he's been in the business towards debt pay down even before that was popular. If you look at how the business did last year, they spent less than half of their available cash flow on capital expenditures and more than half on debt pay down while keeping production relatively flat. Now they're doing even more of that along with starting to return capital through share buybacks. That's actually now become more in line with the general industry. At the time that Baytech started doing that, that was not norm. This is something where the industry has come around to what they're doing versus Baytex adopting the thing that happens to be popular right now. The one other note there is that in 2020, their leverage was at the end of the year, six times debt to cash flow. Take a business like that, and they're on track by the end of 23 to be zero debt, maybe even a little net cash. You completely change the profile of the business. You change the risk profile and you change the appropriate valuation. It does beg the question, if you have wells that will produce at 500% IRRs and oil prices are where they are today, why not drill more? Why return that capital to shareholders if there's such an attractive opportunity set from a capital investment standpoint? That's a great question. And I think that's something that frustrates their shareholders. I think they had been resistant to that at higher debt levels and more interested in just paying off their absolute amount of debt. But it does look like we're seeing the early indications that they're ramping up production and ramping up activity. The interesting thing about 500% rates of return, and again, discount those heavily, maybe they're 200% rates of return, but even at a 200% rate of return, you're getting your money back in six months. And some of their wells legitimately are a lot better than that. If you can do that, you're essentially putting in money into a flywheel and amplifying it rapidly. It does look like they're at their early stages of doing that a little. The nice thing about it from an industry perspective is there are very few fields in North America and in the world where you can earn returns anywhere close to the returns that Baytex is earning. It's interesting because Baytex is doing this, but many other companies aren't able to do it because the capital efficiency is so much better in the clear water and so much better specifically in Baytex's clear water than most of the other places that companies are active. It does look likely that they're going to be able to grow out of their debt problem to some extent, in addition to actually paying off a lot of their debt. So I think they are doing it. I think it's been something that's been frustrating for investors that were betting on higher oil prices, that they hadn't grown faster. I think it's organically happening as these wells are just so productive that they almost can't not drill more and produce more. It's also something where as they pay down their absolute debt levels quite a bit, they're more free to essentially put a little more capital into the business to be able to accelerate that process. An interesting inflection point. As an investor, how do you approach these businesses? What are the metrics that you use to value an ENP and oil producer? I generally triangulate because I've found that relying on any one metric can end up exposing <laughs> the capital to loss. And frankly, it's been such a tough business for so many years to invest in the oil and gas industry that it's really necessary, I think, to take a very careful approach to evaluating and every individual opportunity to avoid being blindsided. Unfortunately, I think we learn these things by <laughs> making mistakes and learning what to look for. I mean, the easy one to point to is production versus enterprise value and production versus debt. To just get a high level idea of how much cash flow generating activity is happening within the business without requiring additional capital versus how much you're essentially paying for it, both from a debt perspective, because the debt absolutely has to get paid back over time for these companies, as well as from an enterprise value perspective to understand what you're paying for it to be able to hopefully get a return on your capital in addition to a return of the capital. There's a production question, there's a reserve question. So these companies all have assessed reserves from their external reserve auditors that they're required to have from the SEC in the US or from the Canadian SEC up in Canada. And there are various methodologies for using these reserve reports. They're kind of as informative as real estate assessments. So they're interesting, they're helpful, but they definitely aren't good things to rely on exclusively. There's also a cash flow measure. And again, cash flow is interesting because it's really subject to your assessment of their likely 
costs as well as the likely price for oil and natural gas and natural gas liquids. And then an important factor there is what the local price is for production. So it's not just about how much the price of oil is at NYMEX for WTI. The question is how much does the oil that you produce in any particular spot sell for? This is very relevant for Baytex because there was a point in time where heavy oil went down in 2018, I think down to $8 a barrel. And then at that time, it was really helpful for them to have all the South Texas production and the Eagleford that they have. And then right now, interestingly, with low value for the Canadian dollar, Baytex is getting extra money from their Canadian oil production because oil is denominated in US dollars and a lot of their costs are in Canadian dollars. So their revenue is actually higher, partly because of a weak Canadian dollar. It's a pretty interesting setup, but it's also worth reminding oneself in evaluating these things that these local factors can change quite a bit. And it's something that requires quite a bit of evaluation to make sure that you're on the right side of that trend, or if you're on the wrong side, at least that you factor that into a discounted valuation. And then well returns are important. Understanding inventory is helpful as well. Understanding capital efficiency. So that's partly well returns, but also is the production falling off a cliff? Does it go away to some extent, like some of the Lloydminster production, or does it stabilize and stay around for a long time, like certain shale production? There's essentially this whole set of factors and building out almost like a matrix to figure out what the right valuation is and what the return profile is for the equity seems to be necessary to identify which opportunities are the best. You talked a bit about the reserve reports that they include in their annual filings and various filings. When you look at one of these producers, what do you look for in a reserve base? How many years they have remaining? Are there rules of thumbs that you consider when thinking about the asset base? And ultimately, the production base today actually means very little beyond this year's revenue. And what ultimately matters is that reserve base. So how do you go about interpreting that and evaluating that? Atex is actually an exception for me to some extent. I've tended to avoid companies that are more active on the unconventional side because they typically have higher decline rates. And typically in owning the public equity, you have to pay quite a bit for future production that's not yet booked as existing production, essentially. So historically, shale-oriented and unconventional-oriented companies traded a significant multiple to the assessed value of their current production. And the idea there, I guess, is that the public equity investors are betting on the company's ability to replace existing production from identified inventory. For me, in looking at Baytex's reserves and reserve value, it took a little bit (laughs) of, I guess, humility and getting comfortable with the inventory that Baytex has, as well as these multiple free upside potential sources, free options. They're not free exactly for me because I consider that I'm paying for them because I'm paying a premium to the prude developed producing value of Baytex's reserves, but they are free in the context of comparable companies being valued similarly without having those sorts of upside. So they're relatively free rather than absolutely free, depending on the underwriting approach. And in this case, it's somewhat easy because you have this ultra low cost discovery in the clear water, and you have this high cost asset that people know about, but seem to attribute little or no value to in the Duvernay. And so between the two of those, it's not necessary to look very far to see how to make up for a gap in Baytex's reserves, which again, they're fine relative to many of their unconventional competitors, but they're not at the sort of discount that I would typically look for. But again, they're made up for by these multiple assets that the market doesn't seem to be interested in giving value to yet. It's a good explanation of why this stock would be a good opportunity in the bull case and the bull thesis. If something were to go wrong or this business were to re-rate lower, What do you think are the main risks there that could drive the stock underperformance and the business underperformance? There is asset risk and there's balance sheet risk. The nice thing is that, and the thing that got me comfortable on the producing value side is the amount of data that makes those risks unlikely. 
But there is a risk that the next wells that are drilled in the clear water are terrible and that it takes a little while for the company to figure that out. That would reduce a lot of upside and could cause the stock to fall quite a bit because even though it's not fully priced in, there's some success that is priced in there. So that's an operational risk. It could be true for other assets for Baytex. It just gets harder to imagine on some of the other stuff because there's so much history. It's possible Eagleford Wells could start getting worse. But again, there's so much history on that asset and on some of their other assets. The benefit of this sort of acquire and exploit model, especially coming in years into it, is that you have a long track record of operational success or failure, but you at least you have a long history and you can see it in the financial statements, not just in claims by companies. And you can see it in the well engineering and field engineering and other stuff like that. Clearwater, I think, would be a big potential risk. Again, so far, it's been a risk to the upside and not the downside. The wells keep being better and better than people expected and than I expected. There's also a financial risk, which again is getting mitigated over time as they pay off their debt. But if oil went to $20 tomorrow, Baytex might suffer more than some of its peers because it still has relatively high debt versus its peers. There's some implicit bet in owning or considering to own Baytex stock that oil prices would stay relatively high versus where they've been over the last three or four years for some amount of time to give them room to pay off debt. At $65 oil, they were paying off debt, but at 40 or 30 or something like that dollar oil, they would be in trouble. But again, if you think about it as a relatively low cost producer across the assets they're deploying capital into, they're somewhat of a good proxy of required oil prices for the industry. That risk, again, it's there and it's important to consider and to incorporate in any sort of investment decision, including the decision to just hold stock and not buy it or sell it, it is really important to understand, I think, the local break-evens for the company as well as the impact from financial and operating leverage like they have. We like to wrap these conversations up with lessons learned throughout the investing process or when talking to the operators, what are the key lessons that you've taken away from the Baytex investment? Things sometimes take years to play out. If you look at Ed LaFerre joining Baytex in 2016, things look terrible a couple of different times for Baytex. And there have been multiple times where many, if not most of the shareholders of the company were deeply frustrated by his strategy and choice that the board and management was making in terms of having this longer term orientation, not drilling wells to get out from debt, but actually paying off debt from free cash flow, not accelerating development in assets like the Duvernay, which had lots of upside potential, but also the risk of bankrupting the company, and then not diluting stock. Once they had to, they did it, but once they didn't have to anymore, not issuing a lot more shares to acquire assets when there was the opportunity to explore using internal resources and be able to find upside that they would have had to pay quite a bit of money for in terms of dilution. So I think a big part of it's patience. Also, I think track records really matter. And the management team at Baytex over time has created value. And I think that matters quite a bit and was one of the ways to get comfortable with the opportunity where you had these very conservative people in this levered structure with this great discovery, it made it a little bit easier for me at least to get comfortable. But also I think there were some lessons in terms of just acknowledging who they are, being able to see what they've done in past roles and getting comfortable that they would do what they had done previously in this company. Well, Josh, it's been a great conversation. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks a lot, Matt. I appreciate it. To find more episodes of Breakdowns ranging from Costco to Visa to Moderna, or to sign up for our weekly summary, check out joincolossus.com. That's J-O-I-N-C-O-L-O-S-S-U-S.com. 